everyone. My name is Angie Raymond. Welcome to the second year of Beyond the Web series. I'm the Director of Data Management and Information Governance at the Ostrom Workshop, and we're hosting a virtual event today live from the Ostrom Workshop where we're bringing in yet another speaker, unfortunately the last one of this year, but we'll kick back off in the spring in February. The Ostroms believed the ideas and theories must be considered through the lens of experience that the critical connection is being between ideas and what gets done. The workshop today has five programs spanning everything from governing the commons to the internet. Today's salon series is brought to you by the program on data management and information governance. The data governance program seeks to address issues associated with data management, information governance, through the exploration and creation of multidisciplinary structures, policies, procedures, processes, and control implemented to manage data information. And I'm proud to present to you today, Doc Searles. Doc Searles, in fairness, has been introduced several times, but I wanna be sure we give a nod to Doc and Joyce for all the hard work that they've done in organizing uh, this event. As the year comes to an end, uh, it certainly would be remiss of me not to say thank you. Well, thank to you. Both of you um, for hosting you, such too. a wonderful event. Uh, and now I'll turn it over uh, to Doc. Thanks, thanks Angie. Um, a few words quickly about uh, the Beyond the Web series. Um, the, the web itself, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, it will never get old, but what happens on it is getting old. And um, what began at Web 1, you might say, as uh, an environment where all of us had freedom and independence, or at least sense that we did, has turned into a feudal system uh, full of um, uh, fiefdoms run by giant companies in which we are subordinate uh, characters. Um, and we're trying to think outside of that and beyond that, and we're bringing in speakers who can speak to that concern. Uh, Vinay Gupta is an old friend. He's much younger than I am, but he's an old friend. Been uh, familiar with him for a long time. If, if you're here, you've read his bio on, on the page you had to get past to register. So I won't go much further with that. Uh, read it again if you forgot. I want to get hur hurry and get into this thing. Vinay's amazing. Take it away, Vinay. Well, hi. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, you know, I, I've been um, sort of involved in common stuff for, I want to say, 25 years, 20 years. Uh, really, first exposure um, was D. Hawk's work. And I, I was part of the Cardiff Commons outfit for a while, um, which it must be, I don't know, late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and so it's really a privilege to be here kind of at the heart of the kind of intellectual discussion about the commons, uh, hopefully with a small contribution to how we think about the commons and how we might go forward and actually implement a commons that uh, does something useful in the real world. Um, so we have a spectacularly overpacked slide deck to get through today. Uh, I completely failed to strip it in the way that I was hoping to when I started working on it. Uh, so we're gonna move through at some pace and um, hopefully that will work. Uh, Doc, plan is to go roughly 25 minutes, then stop for a couple of questions, then do a summing up? Yeah, uh, yeah. Give, basically give plenty of time for Q&A. Yeah, so <laughs> I'll, I'll, after the Q&A, I want to try and do a sum, summation after the Q&A, so I'll try and stop a good and for the Q&A. So we're going to go about 25 minutes, so we're going to be cracking on. So very briefly about my background, 90s in tech, after 9-11, defense, security, and resilience, mostly working on disaster management. 2014, uh, I decided to sell out and get a real job and happened to join the Ethereum Foundation. There, I was the release coordinator for Ethereum. That's probably the oldest person in the team, pretty close. Um, and a lot of what I brought to that was global perspective and a certain sense of what our priorities ought to be. And I hope that that's had some stamp on that project. Um, so what we're going to be talking about today is literally how we fix the global economy such that it doesn't destroy the natural capital and the productive capacity of the world while producing plastic trash which we throw away into landfills and generally speaking are completely unsatisfied by uh, and it's a real squaring of the circle right we need to be in a position where you know we can run a successful growing global economy but without destroying the world in the process and you know, here we look at all our old friend natural capitalism, this notion that the if we actually accounted properly for the nature that we destroy by running production processes, we would no longer think of the world as being profitable. 
we wouldn't think of companies as being profitable because if a company is destroying five million dollars worth of nature every time it produces one million dollars worth of goods it's bankrupt and the idea that if you have correct accounting practices we can show that the world is massively in the red and that ecological deficit becomes a manageable thing that we can start working on that informs a lot of the stuff that you're going to see here uh, and what we're going to be talking about specifically is the circular economy and the incentives in the circular economy and the difference between circular economies and spiral economies all of the account keeping for all this stuff to be done on the blockchain as you'd expect um so the core idea is that we stop manufacturing goods to throw away by changing the incentives of market capitalism to produce durable goods and those durable goods when you buy them the rational expectation have you have is that you will sell them again right and if we think of trying to sell everything that we owned rather than being able to throw it away you know you buy yogurt in a plastic tub the plastic tub has no marketable value there's just no way to get rid of it at that point it's a dead loss you paid for the tub you own the tub you can't dream your money for a plastic tub that sounds kind of ridiculous but if we think about a car a lot of people buy a car with the intention of selling it again. You'll have the car for a few years when you're in this place. You'll move house. At that point, you may not want a car. You're moving into a city. You sell the car. Buying things that you intend to sell again changes our relationship with the goods. And this is the critical idea. How do we make a world in which everything which is bought is intended to be sold again? Because that is the fastest way of getting rid of trash, not producing things which we intend to throw away. Um, so... <clears throat> to build that model up, um, let's start with a, a sort of map of the global economy. Um, we start by producing things, and then we trade them to people and we sell them. Production, consumption, you know, one person has potatoes, somebody else has wheat, they do a trade. This is the kind of atomic unit of the economy. Um, the consumption step always produces waste, um, you know, plastic trash, whatever's in the landfills. Uh, also, economic inefficiency, you know, poorly insulated buildings, you heat the building, heat escapes, there's always waste in the consumption step. Likewise, the production step is scaled through investment. So you, you have a four-function system, investment produces production, production then drives consumption, consumption then causes waste. Um, at every step here, if you increase the amount of investment and you increase the amount of trade, you increase the amount of harm. and that is the fundamental calculus that we're trapped inside of in the global economy. We cannot figure out how to keep the economy growing, which we have to do because we have billions and billions of people who don't have enough stuff. They lack physical goods and it impacts their health and well-being. We have to figure out how we do this without producing the same kind of harm function. How do we scale the economy without breaking things? Um, half of the economy has already gone through this absolutely dramatic transformation driven by data. So starts in the 1950s with quality control, then you get quantitative finance in the 1980s where you start bringing big computers into things like hedge funds, private equity, investment strategy, pension funds. Then in the 2000s, we bring it to trade in the form of tar targeted advertising. So what we've built is an enormous statistical process control machinery that controls the first half of the economy. The problem is that that process stops as soon as you walk out of a shop with an object. You come out, you buy a thing, you walk out, the thing no longer has an identity, it no longer has a name, nobody's responsible for it other than you, nobody's gathering any data from it. It literally just becomes a hunk of junk. And when that stuff winds up in a landfill, we don't know what it is, we can't identify it, we've got no way of putting it back into production by recycling it, because we can't identify what the stuff is most of the time. And this is the problem that we have. We've done massive numerical optimization in the first half of the system, but we haven't touched the second half. And if we do start instrumenting the second half, we might be able to start moving away from a model where what we have is this enormous destructive waste system, right? If we could instrument what was happening post-consumer, we could actually get a dramatically better understanding of what's happening in the waste system. We could start pricing the damage being done and we could also start recovering value in the waste streams. Um, and this is the vision that we're really, you know, talking about today. What happens when we instrument every step? Production, 
consumption waste, if you correctly instrument waste, we should be able to get rid of most or nearly all of the waste by taking a thing which is being thrown away and figuring out a new marketplace for it. And the old model circular economy is that you find a new marketplace by ripping it down to its raw materials. The new model circular economy, which we like to call the spiral economy, is you don't rip the thing down to its raw materials, right? You take hold of the object, you put the object into you know, some kind of um, marketplace which figures out what the fair value for the object is. And once you've figured out what the fair value for the object is, you can resell it much more easily, right? You know, you, you take things, you put them back in their place, you find a market, you sell the thing, it never enters the waste stream. And then if you could figure out how to incentivize manufacturers properly, the manufacturers as they produce this stuff are um, naturally going to produce stuff which is more durable, lasts longer, has higher value in these secondary marketplaces, and that then generates wealth overall. Because if the manufacturers are no longer throwing the stuff away, everything becomes a lot easier to work with in terms of managing the waste streams. Um, so here's our model, right? Step one, collect the data. Step two, we'll talk about that part. Step three, profit. Because if we can't figure out how to make this thing stand up in the global economy as it currently stands, there's no point even starting, right? At this point, there is no real probability of getting a non-market-based solution to scale because where we are right now in the position that we're in right now is it's just very, very difficult to make change on environmental issues inside of the existing governance structures that we have. It's close to impossible. Um, so <clears throat> let's talk about how these loops actually operate right now. Investment drives the creation of capacity to make manufactured goods. Investment produces production. Production then causes trade and consumption. When something is sold into consumption, there's a return on investment and money which drives the investment. This is the investment loop. The investment loop drives then a, a waste stream, which can be recaptured and brought back in through recycling to reclaim value. But that information, that recycling step is information dense. When you're recycling something, you have to know what it's made of, you have to know who wants it, you have to find some market for it. And right now, because of the problems that we have with the information management at the recycling step, it's very, very hard to get recycling to work at any kind of scale, close to impossible. So what we get is a lot of the stuff that you would hope would be recycled isn't recycled, or it's recycled in a way that is downcycling, destroys value in the downcycling process. And as a result, every time we go around this loop, there is capital depletion. Money is thrown away on waste, but more specifically, natural capital depletion, because what's invested at the first investment step is not only financial capital, you're also investing natural capital, trees, energy, climate stability, all of that stuff goes into manufacturing, you know, this pair of roller skates or that laptop. And as you go around this loop, the return on investment in financial terms often looks pretty good. But the unpriced capital depletion of natural capitalism from the waste stream is invisible. And this is what we have to solve if we're going to have a growing economy, which also manages to uh, not trash the future and provides for more people than we're currently providing for. Um, so the way that we do this is we <coughs> destroy the notion of consumption. right? Not the notion of use. But the idea that the goods are consumed, that they're destroyed by using them, they're utterly eaten, this is the thing that we can get rid of. So if goods are manufactured to be durable, then at that point, you make the thing, you use the thing, you get bored with the thing, and you sell the thing to somebody else who wants to use it. It never becomes consumed, it never enters the landfill. And you sort of say, like, really? Can we do that? It's kind of like, actually, yes. I mean, you know, Tools made of decent stainless steel will last forever. Um, I'm wearing, I don't know, 25-year-old jeans, something like that. I mean, I bought them secondhand, you know, with a little bit of luck, I'll sell them to somebody when I'm done with them. Um, you know, they may be recycled, they may be downcycled, um, but for the most part, most of the stuff around you, if anybody cared enough to make it durable, it would last forever. And it's really only because we don't have any way of pricing the waste streams or any way of running effective resale that the stuff which is just plain trash exists. You know, it, it's not natural that things fall apart after a few years of use. 
that's actually just very, very, very lazy uh, production processes and also our good old friend designed in obsolescence. So this notion of continually reselling and reselling and reselling, transaction costs factor critically into this. If you're going to go around this loop where the thing is manufactured and then it's used and it's resold and used and resold and used and resold and goes round and round and round, you know, you have to make it economically efficient to go around that loop. Because if you don't, what happens is you just run out of will to go around the loop. The thing just loses so much value, it's no longer an, it's no longer an asset. So it has to be efficient. You need efficient markets. You need efficient secondary markets to keep the goods out of landfill. And you need some kind of payback to the manufacturer for making something so durable so that they're correctly incentivized to make durable things. That could be a carrot or a stick. We prefer the carrot. Um, and I think I covered this, right? Like you don't want to be in a position where your circular economy is ripping things to pieces because then you have to go through the cost of remanufacturing. So the model that we suggest is this. <clears throat> we get rid of the waste stream completely. We do investment, production, use. The user, say, buys a bicycle. They ride around on the bicycle. They do 5,000 miles on the bicycle. They decide this is not the bike for them. They want something lighter. They then resell the bicycle, but they don't just knock on their next door neighbor's door and ask them if they want a bicycle. They get the bicycle recertified by somebody independent, presumably a representative of the manufacturer, like a local bike shop. The bike shop gives them a condition report on the bicycle, and that is attached to the bicycle's digital identity. Once that's been done, um, the manufacturer takes a payment for the recertification refurbishment process. So if they see that same bicycle come around 25 times over 10 years, they will get 25 payments for doing the recertification refurbishment. And every single new buyer of the bicycle comes along and purchases the bicycle with a manufacturer's warranty. And that as an approach really changes the relationship between the manufacturer and the bicycle. Because for them, it's not that they sold it and it left the door and maybe there's a liability when they get a warranty claim. It leaves the shop and it's an asset because as long as somebody is riding that thing and resells it, they're going to see it again and they're going to get some more money from the work that they do to refurbish it and also for the recertification. So what we're talking about here is the design for maintainability. You design the thing to be repaired. You design, you make it easy to certify, to verify what its condition is. You make it something which is designed to live in a circular context rather than being designed as something which will be trashed. Um, and so what you have is a, a two benefit system. I sell the object. I, as the seller of the object, get the lion's share of the money because I'm passing the goods on to somebody else. However, the manufacturer also takes a chunk of the money. As a result, everybody is incentivized to keep the goods in good condition and keep them flowing around the circular economy. The manufacturer might charge a pretty hefty fee for doing the recertification and refurbishment, particularly if the goods are safety critical like a bicycle. But in this context, as long as that fee is high enough that it makes them feel good about doing a refurb rather than selling a new bike, they should be in a position where they're making more money in this model than the current model. Now, how does that work, right? You take the current bike industry and you say, well, how, you know, if they if these bikes just go around and around and around and they're constantly being resold, where are they going to find a market? Doesn't everybody already have a bike? And the answer is, of course not, right? Far more people want bicycles than have bicycles, and the people that have bicycles want better bicycles. So what you get is a gradually increasing spiral. The manufacturing continues to operate. And it continues to make new goods, and the new goods are sold in the first world economy. And then the goods are just gradually working their way out on the spiral into poorer and poorer and poorer places as they get older and older and more worn down. They become more obsolete. That's okay. Somebody still wants it. So what we start talking about doing is increasing the sheer volume of physical goods that the human race has manufactured because we keep running the manufacturing processes but we hugely increase the availability of goods to humans that want goods. And this is how we generate economic growth. More people get more things, but we don't do it by producing this enormous waste stream and this enormous kind of destructive overrun of capitalism. The whole thing is much, much, much tighter and cleaner. And this approach of reading the ecological chart on incentives 
I think we are now pretty clear from COP27 that we are not within our lifetime going to see anything that resembles, you know, a fundamental transformation in, you know, ecological footprint led by governments. You know, they've made it very clear that three Celsius is where we're headed and they haven't done anything significant yet. Probably in five years, they will start to do something significant, but by then we will be locked onto three Celsius. And if we don't have very, very, very radical change through some other mechanism, the governments are going to do all of us. So we really have to kind of get into this pretty quickly um, because I just don't see the state leading on this. Although some of the, you know, some of the stuff happening in America is indicative. It's not until they stop subsidizing fossil fuels that we could actually start talking about some potential for real change. Um, so last thing in this section is, you know, to the two commons, right? There is a commons of physical things here because in a sense, these are shared assets. On any given day, a specific named individual owns the specific bicycle. But in actual fact, all the future owners of that bicycle have a kind of virtual stake in the bike. If there are 500 bikes that people own and you know 500 other people want to buy a bicycle now and again, you buy one, you ride it around for a while, you get bored, you sell it, whatever it is that's happening, there is essentially a common pool of bikes that are being bought and sold inside of a community. And that as a model, you know, the bikes are akin to a commons. They're not strictly a commons because they have a single owner, but the market infrastructure and the technical infrastructure, which allows people to casually buy and sell the bikes, makes the bikes more and more and more delocalized and more commons-like uh, simply because they have this very, very strong model of um, collective uh, access, right? If you want a bike and the folks know that you want a bike and you bid out on some bikes, hey, I really need a bike for next weekend. I want to go up to the mountains, give me a bike. Somebody sells you a bike because they're not using their bike that weekend. That's now your bike. When that person wants a bike, they might buy it back from you or they might buy it from somebody else. The pool of bikes becomes kind of delocalized. It just kind of swishes around. So this is, uh, sorry, the physical commons aspect of this model, right? There is a physical commons. It's not quite like a regular commons because we still have atomic ownership. Um, and the atomic ownership is there to make sure that people take care of their property, helps with things like casual damage. Um, and then we also have the data commons, right? And the data commons is the pool of information about all of the bikes, right? When were they manufactured? How much have they been ridden? How often have they been repaired? How do they last? And that data commons helps the manufacturers manufacture better bikes. It helps me buy a bicycle, which is of better quality when I make a purchase. And the data commons is what generates the data footprint, which encourages the manufacturers to make goods which are fundamentally more durable, right? We have to design goods for long-term fleet use. We have to design goods for repair. We have to design goods to be used over and over and over again. And in this kind of model, um, this is a simple, clear, direct way of shifting the incentives because that, that data pool tells you what the good stuff is and it tells you what lasts and it tells you what's worth buying and it just shapes your experience. Um, so this is the this is the notion of how we actually shape the, the data modeling for, it, for this. Um, does that all sort of make sense so far? Yeah. Uh, okay, good. So... Um, now I'm going to crack on and actually show you a little bit about what we think this would look like in terms of consumer experience. I say consumer, user, right? See how easily the old language slips in. Yeah. Um, so you have an object. The object has a digital tag. Uh, I can show you some of the digital tags here, if you can see those. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we can um, a, little, a little thing, yeah. Yeah, so those things are quite, that's a very, quite an aggressive piece of technology. You get those from a partner company, they're really good. Um, and goods have these things manufactured into them or they're fixed at a later date. You scan the tag, you access the data record about the thing. We call it an asset passport. Um, that asset passport is basically like a digital twin of the object. And so you have the physical object, you have the digital twin of the object, and the certifications are provided by human beings that have examined the object 
or potentially things like um, scanning robots where you drop the thing into a machine and the machine takes pictures of the object from all sides under controlled light conditions and then gives you certified images of the object, right? Very simple model. You know, the digital twin is continually updated because every time somebody wants to buy the thing, they have to get a condition report before they purchase. When somebody wants to sell, they have to get a condition report before they sell. You're never going to buy something blind in this model. There's always going to be a third party that does a condition report and adds that data to the digital, digital twin. Um, as a result, the objects wind up with histories. Obviously, in a GDPR environment, this stuff has to be anonymized. It's a good idea for it to be anonymized anyway. But that, you know, being able to get even anonymized data about how often something has been used, this is the equivalent of things like car mileage. It tells you what you're actually dealing with. Um, and this is a little video that basically shows we can do this for all kinds of stuff. This is sort of on the commercial side of the house, but this is not actually relevant to what we're talking about in terms of the environment. I will note being able to do this for real estate is very helpful when talking about commercialization of this approach, because all real estate is circular. All the real estate on earth has already had 5,000 owners. So at that point, being able to say, you know, yes, it also does real estate. Real estate is a kind of circular economy that people already understand. Um, so we talked about this, we talked about the spiral. Um, and in terms of the sort of, you know, the 10 R's, right, where we are on this scale, you know, we're encouraging rethinking of how the products are designed. We're very much encouraging reuse. And, you know, the intention here is to basically try and stay as close as possible to the sort of early stages of the sort of reduction in footprint. Right. Refurbishing only happens if the goods have to be refurbished. If they're in perfect condition because they were designed for circular economy use, you don't need to do nearly so much work on them. Um, so we talked about this. Uh, so, um, and this approach of being able to go round and round and round indefinitely, you know, as long as the process of transfer is economically efficient and you don't lose too much money every time the thing changes hands, it doesn't take too much time, it doesn't take too much labor, it doesn't take too much effort everything stays tightly reconnected. If each one of these jumps takes 10% of the value of the object, the circular economy runs aground because you need so much time and labor to be able to do the circularity. But if these processes are economically efficient, you can just fly through this stuff. Um, so th that mechanism, right? Over time, the goods lose value. They lose value because of wear and tear. They also lose value because of the accumulation of doubt about what the goods are because the provenance of the goods becomes less clear. Right? Second hand feels very different to 15th hand because you don't know what's been done in terms of maintenance and repair in that time. You've got a lot more questions about what's happened to the goods since they were manufactured. The more you can design goods to be durable and easy to recertify, the less value they lose in each transaction. Similarly, the better the expertise is that does the assessment of the goods, the easier it is to maintain the value of the goods through their whole lifespan. And this is exactly the kind of area where you start thinking about artificial intelligence, because if I can show you images of a handbag and then AI gives me some kind of rating for how you dinged up the thing is from previous use, that might be the kind of thing that would allow us to automate a bunch of these processes to make it even easier to get goods through these circular processes. Um, but it's it's very important to keep the transactional efficiency high because if the goods lose too much value on the, through these processes, you just can't get the liquidity in the markets. Um, actually, I should pop back to this. All this stuff is really talking about lemon markets. Um, I haven't gone into the technical economics of the lemon markets and what happens when you put insurance into lemon markets, but if you're wondering what the, the underlying economic model is, the underlying economic model is lemon markets. Um, so we talked about asset passports. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to pause there for a second. The next set of slides is talking about the specifically sort of Ostrom implementation level of that. So what I want to do is stop now, take some questions, and then I'll do about 10 minutes at the end, really to discuss how this stuff fits into the Ostrom model and what we can learn from her work and how that might change the way this set of products actually functions in the real world. Thanks. Um, just so the room knows, we have not been able to see the chat in the room while watching you at the same time. So 
I don't know what's being said in the chat. Um, we're kind of looking back through it, but um, can you see it there, Vinay? Yeah, I'm just I'm just looking at the chat okay, now. Good. Okay, you take it from there. Um, okay, so genes can be recycled by Ridwell and turned into insulation. Yes, if you do things like turning genes into insulation, this is downcycling, right? And downcycling is certainly better than just throwing into the garbage, but it's a lot less good than simply reusing the stuff because reusing the stuff is just dramatically less damaging. You know, if you have a pair of genes, they get stripped and turned into insulation. Somebody then has to make another pair of genes. Now you have two problems. You want to keep it as clean as possible. Um, we have a question here too. You want to... You want to go? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, so I am a doctoral student uh, from the law school. I think about this through the lens of law. And um, mm -hmm. so uh, given the, the example that you talked about uh, in terms of bike, I was thinking, are, are you, is this equivalent to something more like renting rather than owning stuff? So for instance, if we talk about bike and I come from Taiwan and we rent city bikes, Right. So I don't own a bike, but I rent it all the time and I don't have to. And the bike is reusable, like like everyone uses it. And then I have to I, all I have to do is just return it to another site. So uh, a lot of things that you were proposing, I think, goes with kind of the economic kind of model there. But like when it comes to law, would you uh, suggest that this is promoting uh, people to rent stuff rather than own stuff? If it comes to um, law or like another angle to think about uh, what you're proposing here. Mm. So we very much dislike rental as a model um, because there is a, a very strong risk that what happens in a rental economy is that you have vast monopolistic franchises that own all of the stuff in society. And then people are constantly paying rental fees just to walk around and you know breathe, right? You know, if you get into a position where your clothes are rented and your laptop is rented and your furniture is rented and your means of transport is rented, if you hit any kind of interruption to your income stream, you lose everything. And what we know from, for example, real estate is that in a rental economy, the people renting the goods will do everything possible to make the goods expensive by doing things like preventing people from building. You know, the reason that rent is so expensive is because in places like San Francisco, you just can't build a house. So as a result, limited supply, prices are sky high for purchase or sky high for rental. I just think the incentives are wrong, you know, for rental. This is not to say that some things shouldn't be rented, but I think in general, very, very robust secondhand markets where goods could change hands for a few percent of their price are much, much more likely to produce a society that we want than rental markets. Um, and if we get into the financing a little, so if we're talking about the kind of technical construction of the deal, the ideal is where I borrow the money to buy the object. And one part of that loan is a secured loan because it's secured by the value of the object, uh, ideally defined by what a third party is willing to pay for the object if there is a kind of put option exercise. And then the small top part of that is an unsecured loan, which covers the difference between the price that I bought the object at and the price that I'm likely to sell the object at. So, you know, $25 of unsecured lending and $900 of secure lending, plus an insurance policy on the object. And in that model, what happens is that you're simply paying cost of capital for renting the money to buy the object. And cost of capital is always going to be lower than the cost at which somebody will rent you the object if it's some kind of uh, rental agreement, like with a you know store that will rent you furniture. So <clears throat> in this approach, even if you are need, need to borrow money to buy the object, borrowing the money to buy the object in an efficient market for capital with the object well financialized in terms of secured lending, unsecured lending, and insurance against the asset being damaged, you just wind up with something which is always going to be more economically efficient than rental because it's still technically purchase. And you've cut out most of the middlemen involved in maintaining rental systems. So even in the position where people have to borrow money because they can't afford to buy the thing, I think you still get a better deal than simply having rental fleet property. And I don't know of any good rental markets, like housing sucks for renting, camera equipment sucks for renting. You know, you pay for camera equipment like a third of the cost of the goods for keeping the thing for a week. It's incredibly expensive relative to purchase. Um, does that answer your question about the rental market? 
Yeah, it's clearly the answer. Thank you. Yeah, um, I mean, we spent a lot of time thinking about it. I just, you know, I'm Scottish. We don't like renting things. <laughs> uh, are there other questions in the Q and A there in the chat? Yes. So uh, I like this for bringing things, but not for things like yogurt containers. No, I mean, the yogurt container is kind of a joke, but it doesn't have to be, right? I mean, things like yogurt could easily come in reusable, nestable, stainless steel pots. Uh, do I have a yogurt container? Yeah, I do, actually. One second. Uh, I'm just grabbing my yogurt container. Here is my uh, yogurt container demonstrator. You know, there's no reason that couldn't be stainless steel, right? And if it was stainless steel, it would have a value of, I don't know, 50 cents or something like that. And you could have a stainless steel economy where I buy my yogurt in this pot and it has a reusable lid. And you know, I keep thing around as Tupperware or I use it as a mug or whatever the heck is going on. And then when I move house, I've got like 200 of these things and I sell them back to the manufacturer. That might not be an efficient way of doing it because actually cleaning stuff is often harder than making it again. The environmental footprint of washing out a stainless steel container and re readying it again for food use might be worse than making it out of some kind of you know reusable material. But it's certainly not implausible that we could have a stainless steel economy for those kind of goods. Um, and, you know, sort of, you know, stainless steel, glass, um, polypropylene, you know, there are definitely ways that you could have quite a robust economy for even the so-called disposables. Because, for example, polypropylene, if everything that can be made out of polypropylene is, it hugely simplifies the process of plastic recycling. Um, but yeah, I mean, overall, yeah, you know, not an expert in food packaging. I don't know the best way of doing it. Um, okay, how do we get the transaction costs down? So getting the transaction costs down is almost entirely about automation, right? You have to have smart contracts rather than paper contracts, automated signing of contracts. You have to have automated payment of people for services like doing a recertification. Um, when you scan the tags, that has to give you immediate access to the data records for the object without having to do any kind of intermediary, you know, search or whatever. It has to be direct. Um, similarly, the payment layer, you know, if Visa was going to eat 2 or 3% of every transaction on a network like this, you would be paying more for the Visa transaction than you were actually getting out of economic benefit for using the circular economy in many cases. So you have to assume that you're going to do some kind of blockchain-based micropayment. You have to strip that layer absolutely to the bone to get it work. And then in terms of who's going to be doing the recertifying and the refurbishing, there are enormous numbers of people that have relevant skills that currently have no marketplace for the skills. You want a position where somebody who knows a ton about furniture, you know, is making a side living because people send them certified pictures of a couch and they then give you an opinion on the couch. And those certified pictures could be taken, you know, by an independent person that, you know, comes to your house, delivers a pizza, takes half a dozen pictures of goods that you want to recertify, picks up half a dozen packages that you want to take somewhere else, uh, and charges you five bucks for doing the entire process. You know, this is not something where we envisage this being a completely separate standalone system. We think of this as something that would be integrated into existing networks like UPS or FedEx for a lot of people. Um, but, you know, are there costs in this model? Absolutely, right? And, you know, people have to get paid for putting their expertise into the systems. It's certainly not something that's going to be economic for doing very small goods immediately. We're counting on, you know, years of growth and refinement before we start talking about doing this for, you know, hammers and satchels. Um, yeah, so the buy it for life question, the core incentivization here is that they get recurring revenue at the step where the goods are recertified or refurbished. So that's where we get the buy it for life angle is the, re the manufacturer getting included in the story at that point. Um, yeah, the tractor looking, uh, the tractor situation is completely unacceptable. Um, and it's exactly why anti-monopoly legislation exists. We as a commercial actor cannot expect to solve the problems which are naturally the domain of government. We think we can change consumer behavior pretty radically, but you know, persuading John Deere to treat farmers better is probably outside of our scope. Um, 
Okay, so uh, let's see, we've got one more question. Sorry, I'm just going through the chat reading questions. Is that the best way of doing this? Anybody has their hand up? Does, does anybody have their mm -hmm. hands up? Okay. Um, yes, hand up. So I, I, I have a question, which is, um, yeah, please. maybe you've covered this in a way, and but it, it seems like there's so many parts to this that have to work in order for the whole thing to work. Mm -hmm. um, where there is nothing right now, where do you start or where does one start? What is the, the, the first or only thing you can do to make this thing get going, going on the road? Is it making sure that everything is scannable and identifiable? And I, I don't know, I'm just, uh, I, I think it's an ideal system, but ideal doesn't always sell. Sure, absolutely. So <clears throat> if we think about gold and real estate, gold and real estate are already fully circular assets. Nobody throws away real estate, nobody throws away gold. So we've taken this model and we've applied it to gold, to real estate, to fine art, and to wine and whiskey. And those are the areas that you don't typically think of as being circular economy, but the stuff does, by God, go round and round and round and round and round. And so by getting into those markets, we've sort of developed a reasonable looking economic case. And you know, we've been live in those markets for a year and a half. So we started out with a collection of um, Star Trek memorabilia. Average price, price is probably what, $500, something like that. Uh, and then over the course of a year and a half, we worked up with gradually more and more expensive objects. The most expensive thing that we've sold is $102,000. And we currently uh, have a customer uh, who has an item for sale for uh, 1.9 million pounds. Um, you know, about $2 million, which is a patch of land in the UK. So, you know, these kinds of objects, you know, all of this stuff about asset passports, independent certification, circular economies, all of that stuff works perfectly well on land. It works perfectly well on Warhol paintings. It works perfectly well on gold bars. The first actual circular economy client or circular economy per se is a clothing manufacturer who do very, very high-end exotic material outdoor clothing, and they're going to basically fabricate the tags directly into the jackets. And at that point, you know, that will be the first real circular economy thing. And they already make goods which are, you know, notorious for their massive longevity. Uh, so that's where we really get into the circular economy process, and that will be the first customer. Scaling it out, you know, if we were just doing circular economy for consumer goods, you know, transportation vehicles, furniture, clothing, and consumer electronics. I mean, I would not think we had much of a chance in the economy of surviving in that environment. But because we have the kind of cash cows, the gold, the real estate, the wine, and so on, you know, those will keep the company growing quite nicely, and we will roll along doing those assets and do more and more and more circular stuff as opportunity provides. But the idea is to build the economies of scale, to build the expertise, to build the technology platforms, in the higher value assets and then work our way down in exactly the same way that you know sort of the iphone was the thing that eventually drove the creation of your 20 dollar android phones which are in the villages like if you want to get global scale it's very hard to get global scale if you start cheap because you don't get the markets to reinvest you start with the higher end stuff and then you work down I saw that uh, Kevin Cox had posted something there. And uh, if you don't know Kevin yet, Kevin is kind of the other thinker like you. He doesn't have the same thoughts, but uh, you might take a look at what he says there because it's interesting. I couldn't read it too well, but... Um, I'm just but looking back here. Yeah. If we think of custodianship rather than ownership, then the community owns the assets and the custodian pays the cost of use. Yeah, so the reason we don't like that model is it changes what happens at the condition reporting point. So if I own the thing and I take it for an independent condition report and the new buyer of the thing is the person that is going to make me an offer for the price of the asset based on the condition report, I am very strongly incentivized to take very, very good care of this thing because if nobody wants to buy it, I am stuck with it, period. My property, my problem. I bought the bike. I, you know bent it on a roof rack, the bike is now damaged, mm, sucks to be me, right? If it's a community asset, then if I bend the bike on a roof rack, mm, well, sucks to be you. And the community bears the brunt of my error or my irresponsibility. 
And it's very, very, very hard in that situation to get a condition report done and then send somebody a bill for the damage they've caused to actually cover the damage. The whole transaction is just much, much, much more difficult. And this is why fleet property in general requires massive subsidies to operate. Like all of these bike schemes, those bike schemes are great, they're fantastic, but they're paid for by government. You know, the two bucks 80 an hour or whatever it is that it charges you, you know, off your little magic key when you register with the bike. You know, that is a tiny, tiny fraction of what it costs to operate those schemes. They're not paying for themselves out of that revenue. So, you know, we really want to change the system of incentives, you know, to encourage sharing, but it's sharing by time slice. It's sharing by sale. Um, specifically because it solves that problem of what do you do about people being irresponsible with the property. I see that Kevin turned his camera on. Do you want to respond to that? He has his hand up as well. So, <laughs> Hey, how's it going, Kevin? Good to meet you. Hi. Um, yeah, look, um, custodianship is essentially the same as ownership. It, it's, you, you still got responsi you've got responsibility for mm. the asset. So it works the same as, as ownership. What we're really doing with custodianship is getting rid of the cost of capital. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. You, you, you don't get rid of the cost of the use of capital, but you get rid of the problem of interest on interest. Mm -hmm. And interest on interest is, I believe, the, the fundamental, because, because interest on interest is getting something for nothing. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. you, you, you haven't earned the interest, but you get paid for using it. And that distorts <laughs> the whole economy. Yeah. So by having the concept of custodianship um, and community ownership, mm -hmm. then you don't get this, this, this problem that people get something for nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the problem then comes into what happens when the goods are depreciating or what happens when the goods are damaged, right? So in a custodianship model, if you break something, then you're going to have to pay for it. Otherwise, you're basically depleting the commons. You're, you're wasting the community's assets. And, you know, it, I've spent a lot of time looking at those kind of models, and I've never seen one that really seemed to work. Most of the time when we actually communalize the ownership of the goods, it becomes very, very hard to get people to take care of them. You should watch what Kevin's doing in Canberra. He's in Australia. You're in London. <laughs> it's over mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you a little bit more on it. So yeah, send me some more information. Yeah. I mean, if you've got worked yeah. examples yeah. when people figure out how to do it, I'd be very interested in that. Because there is certainly a very, there's a tricky middle area. So we agree condition reporting, you know, ownership, transfer title, all the rest of that stuff is there. But there is still a point where, you might want a 25 person group to buy seven or eight bicycles and then share them. And in that instance, you have a much more kind of custodian shaped situation. And the idea that you could transfer custodianship without transferring legal title, lots of interesting things happen there. Um, Doc, uh, I wanted to suggest um, we sort of move on to the kind of final sum up and I actually go through right. some of the Ostrom stuff. Maybe yeah. one more question and then we do it. Anyone have want to put their hand up, or uh, is there something in the chat that we missed? I can almost read it from here. So, uh, there's a question about community providing financing for ownership, and there's also a question about you being in doing things with books, uh, a circular nature of books. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, books is a really interesting one. You know, college textbooks would be an obvious place to apply this. Unfortunately, college textbooks is a horribly corrupt marketplace. It's just awful. So I'm kind of not inclined to fight that fight quite yet, but it is definitely a thing that I'm interested in. Um, and oh yeah, the question here about are there manager manufacturers that are doing refurbishing and resale now? Yes. North Face, Patagonia, Paramo, IKEA, and uh, Screwfix in the UK. Screwfix is kind of like Home Depot. It's a big kind of uh, manufactured, you know, kind of like building tools, this kind of stuff. We're all doing a circular economy model right now. Like it's really stuck up on us. Um, but it turns out that the industry is moving very, very quickly in this direction. That's part of the reason that we're doing a lot more circular economy stuff now. 
because, uh, you know, we thought that it was going to be quite a bit further in the future before we started to see this move, and now it's actually begun to move, so we're trying to get moving uh, to keep track. Okay, so um, let me just go back here. So now I want to go through and do a bit of a kind of summing up and also examine, you know, the actual Ostrom structures underneath this. So for these slides, on the left side, I'll have one of the eight principles uh, from Ostrom's work. And on the right side, I'll talk a little bit about how you might use blockchains to implement that model. Uh, and for this stuff, if you have any thoughts or questions or feedback or ideas, just chip right in. I'm not going to stop for questions. But if you have comments, like now is the time because you know a lot more about this stuff than we do. Um, so point one, this I pulled straight off Wikipedia because, uh, as you can tell, I'm a scholar. Um, <laughs> current defined assets. And, <laughs> sorry, current <laughs> defined assets and actors, right? Um, so I think this asset passport model where you've got lots of people who are certifying what something is, is a pretty good way of clearly defining the assets. And then clearly defining the actors, we assume digital identity of some kind before you can buy and sell inside of the system, because otherwise it becomes very hard to handle the transaction costs. And we don't think the governments would be all that happy if we used anonymous digital cash for all this stuff. Um, any questions or comments there? If not, I will move on. Oh, yeah, it's, it's a good arrangement. Okay, so useful common resources. Um, this is out of our scope. We have to assume that the people that have useful resources are going to put them into the system because we're not going to, for example, raise capital and then try and buy things that we anticipate people need it. This is much more about onboarding existing things. But if there were already pre-existing community groups that wanted to raise money and then buy things and put them into this kind of circular framework, we'd be very interested in helping with that. Uh, any points there? If there are any points, just jump in. Well, I, I just want to say, I think this is the first time any speaker has tried to contextualize what they say with, with the Oster principles. So, uh -huh. so hands on. You know, like, I mean, I've been thinking about the Ostrom stuff, like we actually uh, have, you know, like a member of the team that we hired specifically to look at how we did circular economy inside of the Ostrom principles, like we are really serious about this stuff. That's great, well. Uh, unfortunately, he's now meditating on a hilltop somewhere in California, so we'll see what happens after. <laughs> he's still interested in helping us. Um, so collective decision making, right? Um, sort of out of scope for this. What we're suggesting is quite a rigid set of rules for the game. However, the place where collective decision-making might come back in is standardization. What is the correct standard for bike recertification? What is the correct standard for uh, the metadata gathering on an object? You know, oh, you know, these pictures that you guys are using, you know, these pictures are too expensive to take. We need to be able to use camera phones. You know, we need to relax the lighting thing. You need to make it okay for us to use image enhancement, blah, blah, blah. And you might have a community debate about whether that was actually a solution or a problem. Um, but it's a little outside of scope initially, but I can see where it would be reintroduced. Um, accountable monitors. So somebody recertifies goods as being good. They are sold. The person reports a problem. They ask to claim on the certification of warranty. The certifier refuses to pay. Oh, no, it was fine. Rah, 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 rah. In our system, you get access to a court who can actually come back in and make the monitor or the certifier accountable. It's a very, very, very direct system. It's strong legal enforceability. Um, graduated sanctions. Everything that we do runs on um, payment. You know, like somebody pays for a warranty, something goes wrong, they claim on the warranty. Uh, in this kind of model, <clears throat> you then have this notion of, you know, small things, small fees, large things, large fees. Pretty straightforward. Uh, access to justice. So uh, this is Anton. Anton is my managing director. Um, and Anton was a center of justice for innovation uh, and um, a variety of other things like Young Foundation and is an access to justice guy. Uh, criminal justice reform in his early career, then access to justice later on. And Anton is in charge of building, among other things, the arbitration machinery so that we can get lower and lower cost dispute resolution as the system scales and becomes larger. But we've actually got like you know, real sort of you know, native expertise in this kind of stuff. We're not just a bunch of tech goblins who are running around trying to build a sharing economy. 
you know, there is actually some serious backbone in here. Um, yeah, he's a good bloke. Um, so official status. The model that we use already works in 170 countries because we built it very carefully to confirm to the New York Convention on Foreign Arbitration. And as a result, the agreements that govern one of these physical objects and the asset passporting and the reporting and the so on, all of that stuff runs under uh, English law uh, under arbitration. So that provides us with a kind of global scope and effective sort of, you know, a globalized rule set. Obviously, when the goods are physically located in jurisdictions like Germany, you have German law that controls who is allowed to buy and who is allowed to sell and how all that stuff works. But when there's a dispute over the goods and their condition, that comes into the warranty system. The warranty system is then handled under international law. Um, that doesn't provide any kind of special legal status for the stuff. But if you want that kind of special legal status, the easiest way is to have a corporation own the stuff. Um, and that corporation could be like the, you know, Manhattan Bicycle Guild, and they own two and a half thousand bicycles, all of which are asset passported. They maintain the condition reports. And that would be an example of a community that could be built directly on top of this infrastructure for doing uh, transfer of ownership. Um, any questions about that? One more to do. Good. Okay, right. So layered governance. Again, if you have these kind of intermediate agencies, you could easily imagine things like a circular economy hub someplace like Brooklyn, where you can walk in with any object that you like. They will, you know, scan it, recertify it. They've got a bunch of specialists sitting around, you know, just doing that for a living. Um, and they take a percentage of fees. They might also provide warehousing. And those hubs could have very, very strong legal identities and could be, you know, doing things like selling insurance for the people that are uh, trading circular economy assets inside of those hubs. Um, and I think that is basically it. Um, okay, I don't know why that is there. Okay, there we are. Um, so there are a couple of talks uh, by our head of design uh, talking about this kind of stuff. Well, one talk and a transcript of the talk. Uh, if anybody is interested, we will post links on that, and I think we'll probably circulate the deck. Um, but yeah, Kate, Kate Pincott is our head of design and has done some fantastic work on this stuff. Uh, and that is it. Two minutes under the hour. <laughs> yeah. So so people on the on the call know, and perhaps in the room as well, uh, we continue talking, and we can continue talking, but the recording turns off after an hour. So that'll... So on the hour, that'll stop, but we're, um, so that'll be accessible on the web and, and public information. But uh, anybody having something more private to say or just want to carry on conversation, um, we, we can do it here. So thank you, everybody. This has been great. Thank you, uh, Vinay. So the people who see the recording will know that we thanked you. We had a proper ending. <laughs> thank you. That was great. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs>